so let's give her the opportunity to be here if she's the one prepared to testify. Um, oh. Speak of the devil. We were about to pause for you, Representative. Devil? <laughs> Speak of the saint. Then. <laughs> Have you ever had a doctor tell you you'd be out by 10 a.m.? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, we are very glad to see the legislature take up this topic. It's one that we've cared about um, for some time. We are in support of all the bills uh, that were presented, uh, although we think that there are some, um, there are some places where it will be hard to write the language to accomplish what you hope to do, perhaps. Um, for example, um, I think a $30 cap on giving is a good idea, but someone might decide to make $330 gifts in a year. Uh, as you know, happened in the past when we had caps on campaign finance, some folks started 100 committees in order to write $325 checks to House members and $650 checks to uh, Senate members. So there are ways that people who are determined to do so can attempt to um, have undue influence uh, due to wealth in the process, I think. Um, so we have to think about those kind of things. Um, likewise, I did go right into a job in which I registered as a lobbyist immediately upon leaving the legislature. But the group that I work for has no PAC, writes no checks to, do, to uh, legislators, gives no gifts to legislators. If you come to one of our events where there's food, you can eat with us, and so can anybody else that walks through the door. We also let you know we're going to report the cost of the food if you, if you come in. So, you know, the reason I register as a lobbyist is to be utterly squeaky clean. So, I was a child advocate on issues of poverty and hunger before I came into the legislature. I ran for office to try to talk about these issues. I've gone back into that field. I'm not sure that you want to keep people that really care about the well-being of our state from working in advocacy necessary, necessarily. Um, I would have been willing to set out a year if, it, if we find that's the best way to, um, to, to do something like this, but since I'm not trying to influence the process through money, gifts, or squeezing people in mean ways. I'm not sure if there isn't some kind of a distinction there, maybe. I don't know. <clears throat> Did you have a question about that? I understand, and you're getting at what we, we talked about. With there, there are some folks who we know move on to lobbying, and if you know them, if you've spent time with them around here, even if it's not for a not-for-profit, you know that the, there was an impropriety. There are, there are other folks who might do it, who on a bipartisan basis we might agree that there could be some impropriety there. Mm -hmm. But if we make, if we try to make the distinction that you're talking about, how do we make it without running and creating the loophole to get around it? So for example, there are fake grassroots organizations that are abundant in this building. Sure. On all across the ideological spectrum. Mm -hmm. If we defined in here that, well, you could be a lobbyist if you don't work for any organization that cuts checks or has a PAC, I think all that happens is the company you go to work for creates a fake grassroots organization, or the big donor you want to work for creates a fake grassroots organization, funds it with a certain amount of money, uh, creates a nominal board of directors, and there's no pack. There's, I mean, they they fit in that definition. Yeah, I share your concern about that, it, and it's not even about ideology. You know, I have colleagues that are in this building that that work on sides of issues that I would never agree with, but I support their freedom of speech to talk about those issues entirely. It's it's when we do things like, well, you know, pr promise people um, salaries after they leave office that have really large numbers of digits in them or um, uh, persuade people to vote a certain way through some type of a, a, a plum that's offered. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you can't sort of stop a lot of it with the other rules, uh, if, if they're written well. Um, 
I, I have no problem with people coming here who've served here because they have valuable things to say. In the era of term limits, um, they're you know, shutting down someone's expertise should they have sincere expertise to share on any topic, even if it's, say, Mr. Bearden, who I disagree with vehemently on, on taxes. I still want Mr. Bearden, Bearden to be able to speak. I'm that ardent of a free speech uh, enthusiast. But it's, it's the ability to squeeze others through, through money, through promises of, of um, uh, positions, um, various kinds of statuses in which you can wield enormous kinds of power and influence. Uh, I think that gets at the heart of the, of the problem. Um, stopping someone who say, uh, you know, like it, it, when Jeannie Kirkton teams, turns out, for example, this is a woman who's worked in you know, nursing for a long, long time and really cares about children and cares about our environment. If she should want to have a voice in this building on those topics that are really good for our state, we would not want to preclude her from being here. If, if the best thing is for all of us to set out for a year in order to make that work better, um, I, I think maybe that's a rule that we would have to learn to live with. But um, I feel like a lot of the problem is the other, the other trappings of, of lobbying as opposed to the fact that you've ever served with, with folks here. Admittedly, people who haven't served here have close relationships with people in the building and have relate you know have influence with you do through those relationships so just the fact that we've all stood and raised our hands together to say an oath doesn't necessarily make me more influential in your life than your pastor through you know your children's teacher uh, your dentist I mean other people that you that you know who have your ear because of the, st the a status that they have in your life um, where they have become a trusted voice <clears throat> It's hard, isn't it? It's really hard to make rules to accomplish what, what we want to um, because uh, folks always seem to figure out somewhere between the comma and the semicolon to do something to mess it up. Further questions of Mark? Mark? First, proceed, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here, and I appreciate your passion and what you do. Can, can you remind me what years you served here? I was here from 2005 to 2012. So I appreciate your years of service. Uh, what I would like to ask, though, in this process, and like you just said, you know, there's oftentimes like the video where we're the cat chasing the, the red dot laser on the wall, and then when they turn the light off, all of a sudden we think, what did we accomplish? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that we're headed in the right direction? Because I know that the chairman has spent a lot of time on these bills, mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate the time and effort that he's done. And so, and as, as a, a committee of government accountability, that's how we need to instill that trust back in to our communities so that they mm -hmm. don't suspect us. Has it improved or has it been happening just like you said? Or are we putting bills in place and people are just side them? Well, I, I do think that the particular proposals, the package of things that we've seen today are headed in the right direction. Um, I think that a lot of the lobbying community would be uh, relieved if we if we did put caps on how much they, they can spend. And even if we went back to campaign finance limits because um, it's hard to unilaterally disarm, even if you don't want to do it. You know, like take when I ran for Senate. Uh, I believe in campaign caps, so I could have said I will take no check of over $600, what the people passed in 1994, or $650, what it had gotten up to before we threw those out. But if my campaign opponents are taking checks for $10,000, $20,000, whatever, it's pretty hard to put your principles in, in place in a situation like that where you have basically decided to tie one hand behind your own back uh, in, a, in a goal that you're trying to achieve for good, good aims. So um, I, I think that uh, this package of, of reforms is, is a, a good start and that adding campaign finance limits to the package would make it uh, considerably stronger because money is a megaphone making the voices of some much louder than others. But, but just like you said, if we take that, that item from each side, so it's not a, a partisan issue, mm -hmm. to where, like you said, you would think the lobbyists would be relieved because then they're competing on an even scale. Right. It's costing them less, it's costing their, their members less as well. I mean, I guess I'm wondering why there's not more groups in here maybe saying we agree with this. Well, I, I, I kind of assumed that one thing that might happen today is that a lot of people would see you privately. Uh, about it as opposed to in a public hearing. That's true. Um, so I think you'll be hearing from some people maybe. Um, but uh, this is something that we sincerely believe with and want to go on public record about. 
Uh, I also think that, that in the cases where you know, people do things like start 100 packs in order to give a small, a small check but multiply it by 100 or 1,000 or however many folks with really deep pockets want to do, that um, by having, uh, well for one thing, by some legislators refusing to play by those games, and by the media scrutinizing it, I think there could become so much stigma attached to it that folks would eventually have to turn it down because it would hurt you in your election efforts. And that that's another way to, to create a more clean money system where folks will refuse to play in those kind of, of uh, circumstances. I think we already know that some names are somewhat of a liability in some races, especially if you are in the limited number of swing districts. I guess another thing that would be very helpful is nonpartisan uh, drawing of districts so we have more swing districts in our state. That would be very healthy for politics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony here today. We had three hands at the beginning. Just making sure there are no other hands, nobody else who changed their mind and decided they had to run to that microphone. Seeing none, that will conclude our hearing on the seven bills previously mentioned. Before we conclude, for members of the committee, this, this might be a really interesting committee. As I, I think it's been interesting in the past. Representative Minton might or might not agree. Um, your questions. <laughs> no, we, no, no, no. Representative Messenger. Um, and I, I think we've got one more who's. I'm in the process of putting together a, a request document that's going to go to DSS, and maybe we can walk through some programs of the Department of Social Services. I'm going to do the same thing for the Department of Economic Development. I had discussions with Representative Kirkman, who's the Chair of Government Efficiency, with discussions to have joint hearings where we have those, basically an oversight hearing in which there's not a bill in front of this committee. Uh, hopefully I'll get that letter out this week, and as we move forward in session, we'll be looking into those areas as well. With that, we will end the meeting.